After 35,000 miles, it's finally time to replace my sprockets and chain. I'm going to show you how I do it on my V-Strom. Welcome to Urban Monk TV. Okay, so we're going to get this uh, V-Strom all ship shape with a new front sprocket, new rear sprocket, and a new chain. Um, I did a review that you can watch uh, in, in my video history of a um, chain lube that I like to use. It's the Liquid Wrench Chain Lube. I've gotten uh, 35,000 miles out of this chain and these sprockets. They're the original. Um, frankly, from what I'm seeing in measuring the uh, stretch using the specifications in the service manual, I've still got life left in this chain. Uh, but the last time I had the front sprocket cover off, I was seeing just the slightest bit of wear on that front sprocket. And uh, that is the sprocket you'll see wear in first because, frankly, there's less teeth and it's contacting the chain rollers more often than it is the rear and so there's going to be more rare, uh, wear there and it's logical that that would be the, the one to uh, replace first. So uh, it's been, oh my gosh, 10,000 plus miles since I last saw that front sprocket. I'm sure it's worn more. I'm ready to replace it and I'm doing a rear tire so now is the time to do it. So. Um, I've got the rear tire off. Uh, you can see that in another video of mine on how to change a rear tire. So just you know, watch that. But now that we've got the rear tire off, let's talk about how to swap out the uh, sprockets and the chain. So the first thing we want to do to get at that front sprocket is remove this cover, and uh, we got to get the clutch master cylinder, or sorry, slave cylinder out of the way. And, uh, and then we've got a bunch of wiring that comes down here. This is a really tight wind to this wire. Uh, I've always thought that was kind of an odd design because there's tension there, but uh, you can release the tension a little bit by just pulling up this little bent over piece of metal with some rubber on it that's just a wire retainer. And then one of your bolts that holds this cover on is right behind it. In fact, it's mounted to that bolt. And you got some down here. So first thing we're going to do is take a five millimeter uh, Allen socket, or whatever you want to call this thing, and get these. Uh, where are you? There you go. Get these removed. Get this slave cylinder out of the way. Um, don't worry about brake fluid, which is what's it charged in the system leaking out of this, uh, it won't. Uh, it's a sealed piece. And um, take your two bolts out. Note that they are two different lengths. One is shorter than the other by a little bit. The shorter one goes on the bottom. Should be able to get this loose. There's a pin on it that keeps it straight. And there's also a um, odd little spacer back there that gets really dirty. So we're going to have to clean that up. And then I can just swing that out of the way. Let me get a rag and I'm going to tuck it up. So I'll just put this rag up here and then I can tuck my slave cylinder up out of the way. Um, this rod is just simply a push rod, but it's got a bunch of gook on it. Um, I think I'm just going to leave it in place for now. I haven't read the service manual on how to do this, I'm just doing it. Um, it's not that big a deal. So let's get these bolts off that are holding that cover. These are 8 millimeter. To get to this one in back on the top. And again, that loosens this. I'll pull it out here so you can see it. So 
it's got that little piece of metal to hold that wire, well there's three wires there, in place. So I know that's the top. And then I got one down here that I can't reach with the foot peg in that position, so I'm just going to get an 8mm open end wrench and see if I can work myself in there. So yeah, if you just get a box end 8mm, you can get a little bit of action on this thing. It does clear the gear shift linkage just slightly. And there's not a lot of torque behind these because they're so small. And I'm just going to have to finesse this out of here. So this one takes a little time, but just we'll keep working at it. And with those one, two, three bolts out, I think I should be clear to pull off this plastic cover. And that is a mess behind there. So I think I will take off this... Um, sensor here and take this and clean it all up. So looks like I've got a single, I want to say that's a three or four millimeter. Yeah, this single socket cap bolt is a four millimeter, so I'll take that sensor off of there. This is just a plastic piece, so when we're putting this back in, we're not going to torque that down too much. Although there is a thread insert here. And I've got it off. Put that sensor up there. I'm going to keep the screw in the part. I keep a little gallon of kerosene around that I clean chains with and clean parts with on my... Uh, if you follow my GS550 Cafe Racer videos, you'll see I use this a lot for cleaning up parts. and. I, when I'm done, I just let things settle in this bucket and then funnel it back in here. And the bottom of this is full of a lot of sediment. But when I pour it off, I get pretty clean kerosene each time. As long as I don't disturb this, you know, I don't pick it up and shake it. Um, and that's, it's just a good all-around parts cleaner. To be honest, I would rather use mineral spirits, but I'm in California and you can't buy the stuff here. So if you're in a state where you can run to Home Depot or <clears throat> Menards or one of those great places, uh, wait, Menards is great, Home Depot, eh, yeah, so not so much. But um, if you're in one of those places where you can get mineral spirits, that's my preferred degreaser because it's, uh, it's not as flammable. But kerosene isn't very flammable either, and it's also not too noxious. Uh, and it makes a great parts cleaner. So I'm going to clean these up. Just cuts through that so quickly. And yet I can still breathe. I could probably still father a child after using this, though I don't want to do that anymore. Well, I don't mind trying. I just don't want the child. I already got a couple. And they're great. Cuts right through. That looks nice. Okay, so after 35,000 miles and using that uh, liquid wrench chain and uh, cable lube, uh, religiously and cleaning the chain pretty regularly as needed with kerosene uh, that's my front sprocket Oop, that's strobe sorry let's throw a little extra light on that so it's definitely worn but it's not too bad I'm changing it no doubt but you can certainly imagine worse anyways we're changing that out could I go another 10K? Probably. So, uh, before we get this bolt off of, or excuse me, this nut off of the uh, counter shaft, I've got a socket cap here that I've got to loosen up. That is a 6 millimeter hex. And that's going to spin. So, what do we got to do? We got the rear wheel off. 
I gotta find find some way to lock up that sprocket, and I'll show a little trick that I learned. I'm going to bring the chain up and reinstall the rear axle. So I'll bring the chain up over the axle, bring my screwdriver down through here, swing the axle around as tight as I can, and put that screwdriver through. And now look what happens when I pull in a counterclockwise or a loosening motion. That thing is tight. And I'm pulling against the top of the chain this way. Here, I'll put some torque on it, and it holds real well. So again, six millimeter. There we go. Pull that out. And now I can get at this. Um, I would normally get on my impact wrench with the socket on this thing and just zip it off of there. But my family is still sleeping, and I'm going to make the assumption that most of you don't have an impact wrench. So I'm going to grab a big breaker bar uh, and accomplish two things. One, help you guys that just have a breaker bar. Two, keep it quiet. So it's a 32 millimeter. You do need a 32 millimeter socket for this. Um, if you don't have a big long breaker bar, you can take uh, you know a shorter wrench. Uh, a lot of guys probably won't recommend this, but I've done it so many times. Um, so, you know, don't try this at home, kids. But if you have, a, you know, a shorter wrench like this, uh, 3 8 drive might be strong enough, or you might break it. But you can always put a piece of pipe to extend the handle on this thing. Um, that's an option. But this is recessed in a bit. I was going to say that you could probably use a large open-end wrench like I did on the rear axle. But um, it's recessed in such that you're going to have a hard time reaching into it and getting a bite on it. But anyways, there we go. Wee! I think I am going to get the service manual out and see if they recommend putting some kind of a Loctite back on there because... Uh, frankly, the only other thing holding it on would be this cat, uh, socket cap bolt. And it's not like there are any, um, you know, there's not a, a cotter pin holding this on, which you found in older bikes. So my guess is they recommend it. I'll check on that for you guys and let you know in this video. So then uh, placing things down in order as they come off, we have that nut. And there's little washer here. Put that down. And the last thing is our sprocket itself. It's on the spline shaft. And there it is. This is a pretty heavy duty one. I know the one I'm putting in there is not as thick and heavy duty as this one. Let's compare. So there's my old one. Here's my new one. They're both 17 tooth, so we're fine there. The splines are the same. They're just not as thick. This guy is a thin piece of steel. This guy's a big hunk, but I think where it's really going to matter is right in there if they are the same distance, from, you know, the same thickness. I'm going to measure that just to be sure. Okay, so I got my caliper out. This guy's the same thickness all the way through, so that's seven millimeter. And then this one, I don't want to measure this width. I want to measure inside where these splines go, so I gotta take this guy and reach in there. Then I'll measure this. Okay, that's about right. What is that distance? Uh, 
Uh huh. It's hard for me to hold this steady. Seven millimeter. It's actually seven point five. So well, seven point four two could be some variation here, but they're very close. I don't think it's going to matter. Okay, so to get this old chain off, um, this thing is riveted on all the way around and so I can just pick any link I want really but I have to grind off two pins you know that are on the same link so it's the outside sorry it's the outside that holds the pins and then the rollers right in between so I'll have to grind like here and here or here and here and once I get that ground down and released, this will come off and we can slide that out and your chain comes apart. I've still got the cutoff wheel in here, but this is such fine work that I think I can just work with it here. So I'm going to go after these two and take them off. So I've just ground those off a bit and uh, get my tool out here. Got to make sure I have the right breaker pin in. The directions here suggest the, um, what do they say, 3.8 millimeter for a 520 chain. And so I got to install this inside the tool. So here's your tool. This thing's installed in here. Here's the breaker pin we're going to use. I want to put this return spring on it and then drop it down inside the tool and thread this down on it. That way you can see how that returns back in as I back it out. Now I'm going to place this with the anvil behind the rivet and then snug this up on the face. And what happened to my wrench? Here it is. These are 14 millimeter. So I'm just going to tighten it on the, the link. So that's held on there nice and rigidly now. And I can put this handle in if I want for some good leverage. And with a 14 millimeter, I can start cranking that breaker into that rivet. You can feel how grinding that rivet off was a big help. I'm, not, I'm just not stressing the tool that much. And that's a few turns. I'm just going to back it off now and see. Uh... Oh yeah, that's loose. And we'll do the other one. So there's those O-rings that ride inside of this outside plate and seal the grease and gunk from getting into the inside of the rollers. And I've come apart. And now I can just pull it out of there. Pretty stiff. Not in that bad a shape though, to be perfectly honest. I'm thinking I could have gone quite a ways longer with this, but um, I did need to change that front sprocket. So if I'm in here, I'm just going to do it all as a set. Now I've got this cleaned out, or cleared out to the point where I can clean it out. And it is a mess.
Get yourself one of these drip trays uh, if you don't have one. They're really handy. This push rod for the clutch can come out. I'll get that cleaned up. Okay, so we're going to put our new sprocket on, which I've got kind of dirty. And then we've got this washer. And I'm, I'm going to leave this all loose for now because I still have a new chain to put on, uh, which will have to come around here, and um, I need the chain to be able to put the torque to this thing. So uh, for now, I'm going to leave this on here, but obviously loose, so that there's no way I can overlook it. And uh, I'll come back and do that later. So time to get our rear sprocket changed out, and then we can change the chain. And so we got to get these bolts off, and the easiest way to hold this thing while we do that is let's just plop it back in our wheel. These are 14 millimeter, and they're tight. I'll have to get the torque spec. This is what they call an impact wrench. Impact. After five of those, my hand hurts. And with the five bolts removed, the sprocket just comes right off. Where's my new sprocket? I set it down somewhere. I'm going with the uh, stock. What have I done here? I'm bleeding from somewhere, but I can't tell where. Oh, this finger. Okay. Pause for band-aids. Blood all over the camera. Oh my gosh. Okay, I've gone and cleaned up this what I call a cush drive a little bit. Also tended to my wounds and stopped bleeding all over my work. Oh, there's a little bit of DNA that'll go spinning around down the highway. Anyway, so this is a new uh, 41 tooth. And, uh, quite sure it goes on that way, as I recall. Yeah. Because there's no way, no way it goes that way. Bits. Now, I'm going to need some thread locker on here. I cleaned up my bolts, or my nuts, excuse me. And uh, I'm going to try to put the thread lock, not up at the top of the threads, but more down where they're actually going to be um, riding in the threads of the bolt and the nut. And, uh, and then I'll get those torqued down and get the torque spec for you. I want to say it's... Oh, well, I wrote it down. 43.5 pound-feet. So let's get some thread lock on these and then uh, get our torque wrench out. So I've gone ahead and put all the nuts onto the bolts or the studs uh, down about this far enough to where I think I can reach in with the tip of my thread lock bottle and get the thread lock to be down on the portion of the threads like I mentioned before where the nut is actually going to ride. That's right where I want it. And I'll just keep going. And then again, 43.5 pound-feet. Three 